Hey Cozy Homies! Welcome to the second episode of the Cozy Cultural Catch-Up. Today, we'll be exploring the concept of total defence in Singapore. It serves as a reminder that each and every one of us have a part to play in ensuring the safety and security of our nation. As of 2019, there are six pillars of total defence. Civil defence, military defence, psychological defence, social defence, economic defence and digital defence. For this episode, I'll be featuring national monuments that best embody each of these pillars and how they've played their part in the growth of Singapore. We'll be continuing our journey from last episode where we ended off at Old Hill Street Police Station. As we work along Hill Street, we will find ourselves looking at the oldest surviving fire station in Singapore, the Central Fire Station. Before we explore the building itself, let's learn more about the history of firefighting in Singapore. Back in the 19th century, fire outbreaks were quite common in Singapore since most of the houses back then were made of wood and attar. To make things worse, these houses are often built in close proximity, which causes potential fires to spread really fast. The firefighters then were also mostly poorly trained and the Singapore Fire Brigade, which is the first former firefighting organisation in Singapore, was only established in 1888. In 1904, an English firefighter, Montague W. Pat, took over the role as the superintendent of the Singapore Fire Brigade. He championed the construction of the Central Fire Station as he saw the need for one in the town area. The fire station was then built at the foot of Fort Canning and was completed in 1909. It housed a squad of fully motorised fire trucks, which replaced the less efficient horse-drawn engines previously used. Accommodation was also provided for the firefighters and their training was also conducted in the parade square within the station. As the threat of World War II became imminent, the British administration painted the iconic red and white facade with camouflage paint to conceal the fire station from enemy air raids. However, the fire station was spared from the falling bombs and sustained several direct hits. When the British surrendered in 1942, most of the European firefighters in the brigade were marched off as prisoners of war. Currently, Central Fire Station is still fully functional and responds to emergencies in the neighbourhood. This fire station has also been involved in some major operations in the past, such as the 1961 Bukit Hosui fire and the collapse of Hotel New World in 1986. The biggest highlight of this monument would be the beautiful facade made of bricks. This is an essential feature of the blood and bandage architectural style, which pretty much sums up the noble work that firefighters do. The blood refers to the red bricks and the plaster refers to the white plaster lining the bricks. Central Fire Station represents the pillar of civil defence and is a testament to the hard work and dedication that emergency services put in to ensure the safety and well-being of the people. While civil defence protects us from the threats at home, military defence is also an important pillar that protects us from external threats. The next destination we are visiting will demonstrate to us the importance of a robust military defence system. It also happens to be a newest national monument in Singapore, gazetted only a few months ago on 15 February 2022. First, Siloso is located on the western tip of Sentosa Island, formerly known as Pulau Belakang Mati. The name Siloso comes from a Malayan word that means rock, which is possibly inspired by the rocky formations nearby, leading to the current-day Keppel Harbour. The main function that Fort Siloso served when it was first built in 1878 was to protect the Keppel Harbour, previously named New Harbour. It is a part of the coastal defence network that involves several other forts in Singapore to coordinate gun positions from different angles a concept that was not widely used worldwide back in the day. Fort Siloso was also one of the first in the world to adopt an open artillery battery design. This means that the guns are not restricted to the walls of the fort and can be moved around more freely, which enables a wider coverage of protection and increases the difficulty for enemies to predict the layout of the fort. During the Battle of Singapore from 8 to 15 February 1942, Fort Siloso was one of the busiest batteries in Pulau Belakang Mati. Even though the guns there are made to fight back sea invasions, most of them can be turned landwards to attack the incoming Japanese troops. However, the ammunition used was built to create damage on warships, which was not effective against infantry targets. The guns of Fort Siloso were also used to destroy the oil refineries on Pula Bukom and Pula Sabaro, so that the Japanese could not lay their hands on those resources. Soon after, the British intentionally destroyed the battery at Fort Siloso on the eve of the fall of Singapore to prevent the Japanese from using the fort. During the Japanese occupation, Fort Siloso was used as a camp for British prisoners of war. Similarly, when the Japanese surrendered in 1945, Japanese prisoners of war were housed there as well. In 1957, the guns of Fort Siloso became non-operational and the fort was manned by Gurkha soldiers. 
These soldiers helped to prevent Indonesian saboteurs from reaching Sentosa and Kapo Harbor during the Confrontasi, when Indonesia launched operations to prevent the formation of the Federation of Malaysia. From 1974, Fort Siloso was made to become an outdoor museum and it provides us with a glimpse of the soldiers' daily livelihood. Many of us learned in school that Singapore prides itself as a multiracial and multicultural society. However, tensions between different communities still exist and that is where social defence comes in. For different races and religions to live together harmoniously, it is important for us to develop the trust and understanding between each other, not merely just tolerance, but acceptance. One of the best ways to learn more about other cultures will be to try out their cuisine, and we will be heading to the most iconic hawker centre in Singapore, the La Pasar. La Pasar is formerly known as Teluk Ayer Market. It was first built in 1823 using timber and atap, which were found to be unsafe and a potential fire hazard. As such, a new market building was built at the same site in 1833 and became a very notable landmark in Singapore. However, in 1879, a land reclamation project forced the market to be demolished and relocated to Collier Quay. In the 1970s, the vicinity of Teluk Ayer Market was made to become a central business district. As such, having a wet market that sells fresh produce in the area was deemed to be inappropriate and the market was converted into a hawker centre in 1972. During the mid-1980s, the market was disassembled piece by piece to allow for a new train track to be installed underground before it was meticulously pieced back again several years later and was officially renamed La Pasa in 1989. La Pasa has a beautiful octagonal structure with Victorian cast iron elements seen on the ceiling. There are eight large entrances on each side of this octagonal building to allow for air circulation and good ventilation. A spectacular clock tower sits on top of the market with a cast iron fountain that was supposed to be placed right beneath the clock tower. Currently, La Pasa serves lots of local delicacies and is a popular dining place for office workers nearby. Since we are on the topic of food, let's find out more about the desserts in Singapore. Hey Kazi homies! Welcome back to our second episode of the Cozy Cultural catch The background noise is really too loud and I'll be doing a voiceover from now onwards. We are at the food court in Wisma Asia and here's what we got. Firstly, we have chendol, which is one of my favourite ice desserts in Singapore. Chendol consists of shaved ice with coconut milk, chendol, which are the green jelly bits that are immediately recognisable, red beans and gula melaka syrup, which is essentially made of coconut palm sugar. One reason why I love chendol so much is because of how simple and delicious it is. I got this chendol from a store called Old Amoy Chendol. Their chendol really stood out to me because they used ingredients from many different countries. I had a brief conversation with the storeholder and he mentioned that they used azuki red beans from Japan and gula melaka syrup from Sarawak in Malaysia. There's just so much international goodness in this bowl of dessert. Next up, we have tutu kueh, or otherwise known as putu pairing. They are made of steamed rice flour with various fillings inside. The traditional fillings they have for tutu kueh would be coconut shavings as well as peanut powder. I love the contrast of the white beautiful floral shape against the green bamboo leaves. Lastly, we have this vintage retro cake that many Singaporeans had in their childhood. It is a sponge cake made with buttercream that is generally lightly sweetened and fragrant. One distinctive feature of such cakes would be this jelly-like gem on top of the cake with nice timber piping decorated all over. The next pillar of total defence we are going to talk about is economic defence. Singapore started off as a bustling trading port and progressed to become a financial hub in Southeast Asia. With limited natural resources to fall back on, it is crucial for Singapore to be a desirable place for businesses to develop and to have a workforce that is highly skilled and competitive. As such, the welfare of workers and labourers becomes a key component everyone will look into. And this brings us to the former Singapore Conference Hall and Trade Union House. Back in the 1950s, Singapore witnessed many protests and strikes related to labour movements, such as the Hockney Bus Riots in 1955. With all these issues in the political backdrop, the People's Action Party proposed a merger of the many trade unions then during the 1959 general elections. After winning the election, the newly elected government went on to build a headquarters for the United Unions and the Trade Union House was thus constructed. On 8 August 1962, the foundation stone for this building was laid by M.S. Munusami, who was a school janitor. 
he was randomly selected to represent the common workforce in Singapore. The Samsui women, who are now recognized for their contribution to the building construction sector in Singapore, started work on this building and completed it in 1965. Former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew officially opened the Trade Union House and Singapore Conference Hall on 15 October 1965, which coincided with the International Labour Seminar, resulting in over a thousand guests visiting the building during the opening ceremony. This building has also witnessed many community events ever since its completion. Some of the events that took place here include job fairs, fundraising fairs for children, flower arrangement competitions, STEM exhibitions, and even a speak Mandarin campaign. National Day Ready speeches and National Day Awards presentations frequently took place here in Singapore Conference Hall as well. In the year 2000, the National Trades Union Congress, or NTUC, moved out of the building and is now occupied by the Singapore Chinese Orchestra. The former Singapore Conference Hall and Trade Union House is also the first post-colonial building in Singapore to be granted national monument status. Moving on, the next pillar of total defence is psychological defence. It is all about having a strong spirit of camaraderie and staying strong in the face of adversity. One particular group of people who stayed true to this would be the healthcare workers. They really exemplified the values of perseverance and selfless dedication to the patients during this recent pandemic and many medical crises before. As such, I would like to bring everyone through the development of healthcare services in Singapore by visiting Boyer's Block. It is located within the Singapore General Hospital compound and houses a museum showcasing the history of medical practices in Singapore. The first ever general hospital in Singapore was established in 1821. It was a mere wooden shed that only provided medical services to the military and policemen. The hospital was relocated many times over the next few decades before settling on Sepoy lines in 1882. In 1926, this hospital was rebuilt and reopened as Singapore General Hospital. This was a huge turning point in the history of Singapore because for the first time, this hospital became a public medical institution that does not discriminate against race and background. This allowed the locals, who were mostly first-generation immigrants, equal access to quality healthcare that was previously reserved for the military and police. During the Second World War, the water supply to the hospital was cut off, causing hundreds of patients to lose their lives and were all mass buried in the hospital compound. After the Japanese successfully took over Singapore, this hospital was used as the main surgical hospital for the Japanese in the whole of Southeast Asia. The Boyer's Block was named after Dr. John H. Boyer, who was the chief medical officer of Singapore during the time of the Japanese occupation. In the first five weeks after the British surrendered, he helped to restructure local hospitals to cope with the wartime conditions. Soon after, he was sent to Changi Prison to assume the role of chief medical officer. However, he was arrested in January 1944 by the Japanese because he was found collecting money from outside the prison and distributing food without permission. He was then brutally tortured by the Japanese military police and died shortly after in November 1944. Boyer's block continued to become the main administrative building for the hospital and its wings extensions were demolished to make space for newer hospital blocks. This iconic clock tower is a very recognisable feature of this building and it has a similar festoons motifs that are present in Victoria Theatre and Victoria Concert Hall too. After taking a short walk from Boyer's block, we will arrive at the College of Medicine building and the Tan Teck Kwan building. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to take any footage because these two national monuments are now home to the Ministry of Health. These two buildings paved the way for medical education and tertiary education in Singapore. Back in the 1800s, Western trained doctors in Singapore mainly came from Britain and India. To face the growing local demand for doctors, the British administration started sending qualified young men to India to receive training to become assistant surgeons. In 1889, the principal civil medical officer then, Max Simon, initiated the establishment of a medical school in Singapore. However, this could not happen as only two candidates passed the preliminary entrance examination and it would not make sense to open the school with so few students. In 1904, a Peranakan merchant named Tan Jiak Kim led an initiative to send a petition to the governor of the Straits Settlements for the founding of a new medical school. He personally contributed 12,000 Straits dollars to the 87,000 Straits dollars fund that eventually allowed the establishment of the New Straits and Federated Malay States Government Medical School in 1905. The school started off with 17 full-course students and 4 hospital assistants, and rapidly expanded to 90 full-course students and 30 hospital assistants over the next 5 years. As such, a new building has to be built to hold more facilities than the students need. Once again, 
Tan Jiak Kim helped to raise funds for the construction of this new building. His fundraising goals were met when he visited Tan Che Yen in Malaya. Tan Che Yen was a very successful rubber businessman and donated 15,000 straight dollars that covered the entire cost of construction. He wanted to name this building after his late father, Tan Teck Guan. As for the main building, it has received a donation from the King Edward VII Memorial Fund and was officially renamed King Edward VII College of Medicine. From 1987 onwards, both the College of Medicine building and Tan Teck Guan building were taken over by the Ministry of Health. The final and newest pillar added to the total defence framework is digital defence. In light of recent trends with fake news and leaks of private personal data, it is important for us to develop a discerning eye for online falsehoods and be aware of how we can protect our own privacy in the digital realm. With that, we have concluded our episode on total defence. Do subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for the next episode on religious harmony in Singapore.